Welcome to Music Matters Podcast with Daryl Craig Harris, talking about all things music with celebrities, artists, music business insiders, and more. Hey, Billy, how you doing? Hey, how are you, Daryl? Nice to see you. So you're, uh, are you in Brooklyn? I'm in Brooklyn, New York, yes. Cool. Born and raised. Yeah. So how is uh, being, you know, so many actually great musicians that have come out of Brooklyn. There must be something in the water or in the pizza. I don't know. What's what's the. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. You know, it's um, it's a, it's it's a funny thing. I mean, Brooklyn was always like Brooklyn was cool. Then for a while, Brooklyn got kind of got like a bad rap and then uh, Brooklyn became cool again. Now it's actually <laughs> more expensive to live here in Brooklyn than in Manhattan. At I know, it's funny how, how that goes. <laughs> yeah, so uh, so I'm happy that I, you know, I lived in the city at one time, but, you know, I, I got that out of my system. So um, <laughs> I'm happy, I'm happy, uh, you know, where, where, where I am. So uh, tell me about the, your beginnings. I know, um, I think you had a father that was a musician, right? Well, uh, my dad played uh, trombone in the, in the Navy in the, in the big band. Um, awesome. Yeah, and then I used to tease him all the time because he, you know, he he kind of gave it up when he met my mom and got married and had a family, and then he kind of put music. He always loved music. I mean, that was a big part of me being uh, what I am today, as far as music. Um, besides him being an unbelievable dad, um, yeah, he was very very supportive of me and and my music. So that was a big help. But yeah, he stopped playing. Um, after a little bit after he got out of the Navy, and he always used to tell the story about one of my mom's brother, my uncle, standing on the uh, fire escape and went like went like that with the trombone thing, and it went flying off. And, <laughs> and, and 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 that was the last time I think he ever. And my uncle thought he was gonna, my you know, my father was older, you know, he was my mother's, uh, he was dating my mom, his little uh, her little brother, and he, you know, there goes this trombone out the window. So he thought he thought my, my father was going to go berserk, and my father was like. Yeah, I'm not going to use it anymore anyway. Who cares? Oh, that's funny. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, like, and your dad has an interesting story, too, because he was actually uh, came straight from Italy, right? He was an immigrant. and Yeah, seven years old. He came here with his two brothers and wow. uh, my grandfather, his father. And uh, that's a crazy story because my grandmother was supposed to come, but she never did. And then she started a whole nother family in Italy, um, which to this day I have, uh, you know, three uh, aunts that, that I got to know later in life who uh, that mm -hmm. I love. And uh, unfortunately, one, one had passed away. But, uh, yeah, he came here in uh, seven years old and he, he didn't even have a slight, slight accent. He didn't even have a Brooklyn accent, believe it or not. Wow. So nobody, you know, really uh, and he didn't have much schooling. So um, he, a great he American hard... story, right? Yeah, he had, a, he, had, he had a pretty hard life. He did what most immigrants do. They come to this country, work their ass off. And, um, you know, he became successful. And But only only thing, unfortunately, is uh, God took him a little too soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's an amazing story. That's something we often forget here about people like coming here with nothing and building, making something out of nothing. That takes a lot of courage. And, and I mean, I'm sure you learned a lot from him. His work ethic must have been tremendous. Oh, yeah, I have my work. If I were to listen to a quarter of what he used to advice, he would give me as far as, uh, you know, the future and work. Um, you know, I, I, I'm happy and I have no regrets of where I am in life, but I would have probably been a lot smarter and, and not had to go through so many obstacles to get here. Yeah, I think that's probably true of all of us. <laughs> we have people, yeah, people, mentor, mentors mean, along the way. You know? I, yeah, I go through that with my son now. And, you know, anybody who has children can understand that, you know, you get to a point where they, you know, they, they want to do it their way, which is great because that's how we all did it. Like you said, you know, that's, we, we all do that. And that's how you learn your mistakes. And, yeah. you know, but, but sometimes, you know, you want to try to help somebody avoid certain mistakes, but sometimes it's a different situation. Everyone's different. So, yeah, sometimes you, know, you have to you have to make them to really learn the lesson. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a, yeah, that's not always fun. <laughs> right, because there's been a couple of times where you know I, I gave advice to my son and he said, "No, Dad, no way." And then you know I was like, "Oh, he's gonna blow that deal." And then he got a better <laughs> deal than than I would have imagined. So, you know, it goes both ways. Yeah, you know what? You never know. And I, I mean, that's great that it, it's all you can do is you know, sort of teach him like your father did and get lead by a great example. 
And uh, and I think that that's so important for for young people to to kind of pay attention. <laughs> you know. Yeah. No. It, it is. You know. Um, back. You know. When I was growing up. Uh, you know. Most families. Uh, whether it was a good thing or a bad thing. You know. Most families stayed together. You right. know. Uh, the, the generation now and the generation before. It's it's very common to only have one parent. And exactly. go back and forth and have step parents and you know and there's nothing wrong with that sometimes it's, it, it can really work out well for for, for, for people but you know there, 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 there's some problems with you know that, that they have to face and challenges that they have to go through for that as well so yeah. i'm fortunate that both my parents were very very supportive of, of me as you know wanting to be a musician and you know yeah. seeing the beatles on ed sullivan you know they watched the beatles with me that night and they saw that excitement at seven years old and I think they kind of got the picture that there's no stopping me. This is what I, I want to do. And yeah. this is what I'm going to try to do. So that, yeah, let's talk about the Beatles. So that, I mean, people have often said, like, so that was 1964, right? When the Beatles were on Ed Sullivan. Yeah, and it's that interesting because yeah. that, that is a very common thread through so many musicians stories of, of our generation, I guess. So, so tell me what, what, what that, how did that capture your imagination, especially with Ringo and the drumming and, well, you know, it, the Beatles just had, you know, people are still trying to figure out what the sensation with the with the Beatles are. I mean, it, obviously, it's just the music, it, you know, it, it was so good that it, it still stands to, you know, the test of time. Right. But back then, you know, of course, as history goes, you know, we just came out of uh, the President Kennedy being assassinated, which was, you know, the first time I... I remember getting under my desk in school, right. um, you know, because uh, and praying for President Kennedy. And, you know, it was the first time I ever heard of somebody being assassinated and what kind of what it meant or whatever. And then, you know, the Beatles came along and they just lit everybody's light. You know, they, they, they were the shining star and they had no idea what was going to happen. You can't plan something like that. You know, you could say you, you're going to be the greatest band in the world, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to happen. Yeah. And then when um, it happens, it's like, wow, <laughs> how do we get yeah, and it? Just, it, 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 it was a short period of time. So me being seven years old, like, like most, I, I, I believe you're a lot younger than I am, but my generation, once the Beatles came on and, and people saw the different look and and just the sensationalism that was going on on Ed Sullivan. It was one of you know no crime that night. A whole you know the history making uh, records broken. It, it just sparked inspiration into anybody who loved music and wanted to play music because then you just automatically became a fan. And then of course the promo machine went into work. Right. Not knowing that it's a promo machine, but it's a promo <laughs> machine. And and radio back then, I mean, if you were played on the radio, that was, you know, that that was the biggest, greatest thing that that could be ever. You know, right. if people forget, like now we have all these TV stations. But back then, everybody was watching Ed Sullivan, right? There was like yeah. everybody in the Sunday country. Night, <laughs> yeah. Sunday night. I, I know, especially in growing up in an Italian family, Sunday night, you were at grandma and grandpa's with all your cousins <laughs> and, and your aunts and everybody. And then either you left before Ed Sullivan and Bonanza or you stayed and left <laughs> after. Right. Yeah. But the hey. Beatles, I mean, to this day, you know, Ringo was doing things that, you know, really he it took years for him to get the credit um and the recognition of of he did you know and she loves you i you know i always said it from day one you no know, he's playing a punk rock beat it's basically it's a punk rock beat you know he's playing on nobody saw somebody playing on a floor tom using a floor tom as the hi-hat right and before before everyone knew he was left-handed and he was smashing the cymbal with his with his left hand it just looked cool visually and no one ever saw it and he was already playing match grip which a lot of guys weren't. So right. all these things subconsciously, they're, they're all going on in your head. You're yeah, I kind of hit all the, hit all the buttons, right? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're seeing and hearing things that you're, you're experiencing for the first time, and it was it was it was just it was just magical. I mean, there's just you know it's been studied and you know it, it'll go down in history. But yeah, that's what sparked uh, me and and so many people to want to be a musician. I wanted to be a different Beatle every day. You know, and then I just, <laughs> yeah. drums just became, uh, came, just became my thing. You know, I just, I started getting into, you know, other drummers and playing along to records that, you know, when I was growing up, that was the big thing. You played along yeah. to a record. 
And your dad, um, being because he obviously had musical training, he was pretty insistent on you studying, right? How, how did that? How did that go over yeah, when you first started? It was, it was, <laughs> it, yeah, it was, it was the typical thing. He wanted to teach me to play trombone when I got a little older, and I, I, I never liked the way it made my lip feel because <laughs> it always used to make my lip feel like my lip was swollen. And it was I was like 14, 15 years old, so I was just starting to get into you know girls. And exactly. I was going to say, yeah, that's not really the big, the big instrument for picking want, up girls. <laughs> and I didn't want, and he used to say to me, don't worry that you're not going to feel that. Well, it's like calluses on your hand that you're not going to feel that. And it doesn't look like anything. And, but I just, I don't know that turned, it was probably wrong, but that turned me off to wanting to play uh, the trombone. I wish I'd, I'd learned to play sax. I always loved sax, yeah. but um, yeah. the tr- So he did try that, but I heard the typical, if you're not going to take lessons, you're not going to get drums, you know, and yeah. I had my little practice pad. That's good motiv- right motivation. Up, <laughs> right. And then right up the block where I lived, I went to lessons, but it was to a music teacher, not necessarily a drum teacher, oh. which was good. I was going to say, actually, maybe that's time, better, right? Yeah. Well, yes. But at the time, I didn't appreciate that. I mm-hmm. wanted to play on drums right. and I wanted to learn, you know, songs. I didn't want to sit and play with a little pad and learn all the notes. And, you know, so I did do it. I did do it for a while, Mr. Gordon. I'll never forget his name. Um, and then, uh, you know, basically from there, I just wanted to play along along to records. And, you know, he used to come down and he used to hang out. You know, he would he he, he worked uh, downstairs as well. Uh, yeah. He was a, he was his real job as a camera technician for Pentax when Pentax cameras wow. was that was at its peak. So yeah. he was one of the main guys at Pentax. Awesome. Um, and then. Um, he also taught himself to be a jeweler. So he actually was a jeweler. So wow. he used to stay, he used to have his workshop set up in the back of the, the basement. And I would be in the front of the basement blasting music. And he'd be in the back <laughs> of these little intricate, you know, wa- fixing watches. Trying to and, focus. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and how no he fun. did that, I, I have no, I, I God bless him. I, well, he I loved know. you. Yeah. 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 He, he, and I, and he was listening, you know, it was like, he was listening to the progression and he would at dinner, he would say, uh, yeah, you know, that thing you were doing, you were playing a little bit too busy. You were doing a little bit too much, you know, you know, so he did, you know, he did pay attention and he, yeah. guided, he definitely guided me. That's awesome. You know, like it's, it's so cool to hear that you had that kind of support. I know you mentioned in your bio that, you know, your grandparents, your, your mom, everybody was really supportive, which is, is, is so important, right? When you're young and you're trying to, trying to learn and trying to, create and being drum drums is not always easy to deal with as a family member <laughs> yeah well if my if my dad's father was still alive at uh i don't know if i would have ever played the drums because when he used to live upstairs on the first floor and i would be downstairs and i didn't even have drums yet but he used to make wine so i used to take these big barrels that he used to have of wine and he used to not like that because then he had to bring the barrels back, you know, but <laughs> I would set up a, a makeshift drum kit and I would bang on those things, you know, and I guarantee he's like, stop beating up my of, wine. <laughs> it, was, it was, well, not only that, it, it just the noise alone. I guess he's trying to watch TV or whatever, you know, whatever he's doing upstairs. And he would come downstairs with the broom and chase me <laughs> on the basement and tell me this and then put the wine barrels back, you know. So, um, it's, know, it's almost like, I've almost seen like a movie <laughs> was, that, that was the scene, but you How know, funny. yeah, so he wasn't, he wasn't for the drums, but, uh, I guess my dad talked him into saying, you know, let him practice, you know, let him play down there and, you know, yeah. and, and eventually, you know, it, it, you know, he was, uh, my grandfather, so he was already old and then he had passed away, but yeah. Uh, not that's you know but you have those fun memories that's we all we all have the pots and pans i mentioned I'm, I'm a drummer for way back too we all have the pots and pans and the grabbing whatever you can grab the drum on and driving everybody crazy oh yeah yeah <laughs> makeshift uh the, the, the makeshift uh drum drum set you know yeah which is yeah. which is what i tell students to this day that's why when they say oh i don't have drums i'm like you don't need drums your parents are not going to buy you drums until <laughs> you, that you show them that you can play the drums because right. drums is an expensive and you don't want to buy one drum set and then have to buy another drum set. So wait until you can get a decent and good drum set and show right. them that you're going to stick with it. And then they'll get your drum set, you know, because you could set up pillows. You could, there's a lot of things you could set up. 
Yeah, so, and it's it's but, about it's about just kind of starting out and learning and then learning your basic stuff and which down the road, as I'm sure you you know, like learning the rudiments, all the stuff that's not so much fun, it all pays off down the road. <laughs> yeah. <it laughs> Even does. learning, like you said, learning music, you know. Yeah, and you're using your hands, you know, yeah. you, you, what are you gonna play? I still play traditional, that's how I, you know, learn. So I'm more comfortable. I could play both ways I do if I'm just slamming, but if right. I'm gonna do something, any kind of so, you know, little flams or little ghost notes that I need with my left hand. I, I'm still uh, traditional. Yeah, but, you know, you. lessons, uh, you know, I, I lessons are a good thing for a certain period of time, but I, I don't, I'm not one on like somebody having to take lessons or being pounded to take lessons, right. especially now. I mean, it's totally different. You know, yeah, because YouTube, the, right, we were talking about the digital thing. Like now, you can go on YouTube and you have you know Weko and Caliuda, and you have the best guys exactly. in the world. Yeah, it's amazing. Oh, happy today as we uh, as we um, you just reminded me as we right. filmed it today. It's Vinny Caliuda's birthday, so I ah. I spoke to him this morning. But again, Vince, yeah, happy birthday, and Hal Blaine. Right, we talked about Hal. Yeah, both both legends in in different different time periods, but still like amazing. Oh my yeah. God, yeah, no, and. Uh, both those guys, you know, both those guys were influences on me, um, of course, like like everyone else. And Hal, I mean, I was so fortunate to become such good friends with Hal. Um, at one time, we used to tease my mom, too, that, you know, he was going to be my dad because, uh, you know, they were they were the same age. And, you know, yeah. and, and I used to bring up Hal all the time. And uh, my mom knew all those songs that Hal played on, even though. I mean, we all know. did, right? <laughs> Well, yeah, but, but without knowing. Without so knowing who it was, was, yeah. You know, like Liberty DeVito always says, everybody says, you know, like Hal was like 14 of your, of your favorite drummers without knowing it. You know? <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> but um, yeah, wow. I grew up, you know, playing along to records. That, that was my big thing, you know, playing. I always wanted to be in a band. I always wanted to have a band. And then I always wanted to be also be a studio musician. I also right. wanted to. And I didn't even know what studio musician meant. I, it just meant to me that that I was I wanted to be on like every song that was on the radio that I was playing along to. Yeah. So in my mind, growing up, I just it, it opened up the doors for me to like every genre of music, which was a lesson without knowing that I was getting a lesson. And right. then, you know, exploring what it's like to, to make records. And then fortunately in the band in my band we did get you know a chance to make a couple of albums and recordings and then i really really wanted to be a studio musician because then i saw exactly what it was you know nowadays it, it that scene dried up and it doesn't matter because the machines you're playing on top of machines which we did back then then it stopped right. for a while now it's back so nobody knows you know nobody yeah. knows who who anybody is on on any records or anything you know you know nobody and this younger generation unfortunately they don't that's not something that they were brought up. You know, I used to buy albums just to see who played on what. Yeah, you wanted to you, know, you wanted to read the record sleeve. And yeah, the whole, yeah, you know that was yeah. that was a whole experience sitting down, getting the record, walking to the record store, coming home. You know, putting the record on, reading. The that was credits. that was me uh, getting my Kiss records <laughs> back in the day, and like opening up Kiss Alive too, and like seeing that photo right with Peter Chris. Yeah, and, no, I know. For me, it was like Made in Japan, Deep Purple. Yeah. You know, it's like once you open that record, it was like, oh my. God god it was a yeah. whole experience so you know the younger generation it's a different way and it's not that it's bad or good or wrong or right it's just different right you know but i do think eventually they do go back and that's what i hope modern drama does for a lot of people is we remind people sometimes we hear oh you guys do the same people over and over well there's a reason why we do the same people over and over those people deserved not to be ever forgotten about right yeah, and they're, and they're continuing, a lot of those folks that you do are continuing to reinvent themselves, are continuing to create new interesting projects. Exactly. And that's a big they're difference. Still right? They're still relevant to this day. So, yes, we want to do some new, new drummers and we always want to turn people on to new drummers. But unfortunately, the music business, you know, the state, I don't want to get into the whole music business uh, thing, but, yeah. you know, the state of the music business has, has been in a bad shape for a while. And now the pandemic just made it completely worse. Yeah. So there'll be, you know, we'll come back and there'll be things and th maybe this is the time and what we needed to have that time to think about, you know, cause let's kind of a, re a reset and, in a way. Yeah. yeah. In music. Cause everybody personally now is resetting, you know, yeah. they're getting a chance to think about things, whether they want to or not. It's just life, you know, it's teaching you a, a quick lesson in life.
So um, hopefully somebody will learn something in the music business. This younger generation will, you know, figure out something because if they don't, it's, it's, I'm not sure, nobody's sure, you know, where the music business is going to go or what's going to happen to music in, in general. I mean, to me, um, you know, food, music is as important as breathing and food to me, yeah. you know, and I think for a lot of people, music is, is very therapeutic, very helpful. I mean, people can't live without music, just like you can't live without food. Yeah, you'll live a little longer, you know, without music, you know, that you, you need food, of course, but you know, I always say it sounds crazy, but like, you know, if, if music is going to be free, then food should be free. I'm not yeah. saying gourmet, gourmet food, but the, the essentials of what you need every day to survive. Well, then that should be free. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's kind of what we were just talking about that before we went on air about um, the situation with the with the, the new technology and kids aren't really used to paying for music. And I mean, it's sort of the same old story that we all know. But um, in a way, it's, you know, YouTube and Spotify, all these outlets have, have democratized music making. Um, and it's debatable. Some people would say for the for for better, for worse. But, uh, you know, people have access to great guys like Cal Yuta, the J.R. Robinson, all these amazing drummers, or even old old videos of Buddy and those guys. So, like, it's stuff that we. I mean, even when I was growing up in the '80s, like, you, you know, you were lucky if you could find a, a VHS tape of those guys, right? <laughs> so right. It's, no, it's really yeah, changed. No, I, I, I know the the instra. Uh, hats off to Rob Wallace and uh, and uh, you know DCI and Hudson Music for, yep, for starting right. those instructional uh, DVDs and VHSs, and you know. That was a, an amazing, amazing thing to be able to pop in a video of your favorite drummer and then play along. I remember one time I brought my drums up into my living room because I, I wanted to, you know, I wanted it to, on the big TV and I wanted to play along with it, you know, whatever. And that didn't go over too, too, too well <laughs> with girlfriends or, or wives right. or anybody. Yeah, exactly. but, um, but, but now it's so easy. Everyone just turns on their computer and there you go. You're playing along. You have your headphones on. You put it in your mixer. You, you know, it sounds like you're on the record, especially if you have right. a... Uh, a, a, a Roland or a Yamaha kit or, a, you know, D-drum kit, any kind of electronic kit. Um, you know, so there are so many pros and cons about the whole social media and, and the whole yeah. internet, and, you know, definitely pros and cons. It's helped a lot. I mean, you could take lessons off of anyone now and, you know, all you got to do is press a button. See, yeah. that, that's the only thing that scares me about the future of the world. We can't have everything be just press a button and, and there it is. In certain things, yes. And it's nice to press a button and have something there. But let's face it, that's not really reality. Yeah. And you, you know, want sometimes you have to work for it to really learn and to really get into it, right? You have to actually meet with the person in person and do the sweat and get the, the thing. Right. Well, it's, it, it's a thing like uh, the tools. The tools are fantastic. It's how you use all these tools. That's that's the most important thing. Right. How you're going to use the tools. Back in the day when drum machines came out, you know, everybody got scared and crazy, and and I was like, whoa. Yeah, people were I, freaking out about the Lindrum and all that. All the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> drums are never going to work, and all my friends and everybody's going, yeah. oh my god, we're, we're not going to get calls. And you were actually I, you were a pioneer with with that. Actually, that's something I want to get into. But you were a pioneer with combining acoustic and electronic drums, right? That was something you got into in New York in the studios. And uh, well, thank you. Um, yeah, yes. I mean, I, I did, um, and it was it was it was a lot behind the scenes, which which was which was fine for me um, because it got me work and it. And, and now people are learning about, you know, the records that I did back then. Right. Um, so so it, 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 it's it's kind of paying off. But it was my job, you know, and and part of me wanting to be a studio musician when I did start playing after the band had had a couple of albums out and we toured and we did the whole thing. We all went our separate ways for a little bit. And that's yeah. when I started really getting into the studio work. And that was right around the time. This is now we're talking, you know, when, when I was recording with mantis which was my band right there were no drum machines there was no such thing it was a little rhythm box you know that yeah. sly used and and uh hall and oats jeff Picaro was using a little bit but um there was no drum machines and uh you know real hand claps we had guys all all roadies and everybody you know doing real hand claps <laughs> yeah. and stuff We'll, and, we'll say you know, we'll say organic, right? <laughs> yeah, and then yeah. even even I mean the tempos on some of those disco songs they're eleven minutes long some of them and and you know there were no clicks. I didn't even use a click for any of that stuff. So when they were, you know, 
and they edited all that stuff. Jelly Bean, John uh, Jelly Bean Benitez. He, right. That was one of his first records that he did, and then he went on to become a superstar. So, um, you know, we, we we had that was our experience and learning. So when when I got into the whole thing of doing studio work and wanted to sound like the drum machine was out now, so I got good at programming. You know, there you go right. with the fingers, just pressing buttons. But there was a big difference between a drummer playing those buttons with right. his fingers exactly. than just the guitar player or a keyboard player or just anybody who thought, yeah, I could go boom, ta, boom, 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 ta, boom, yeah. ta, you know. So, and then it would repeat and play in perfect time, just quantize it and and, and you have it done. So it was cheating a little bit, but it, it also inspired a lot of people to, myself included, to learn to write songs. Yeah. So it really taught me, I loved it because it was like all of a sudden, the drum machine, I could get the idea. I, I mean, there's only so many beats you could play in a pop song anyway. So you would get a basic <laughs> yeah. beat. And, and if you just play two and four, it, it, you know, there's your, there's your click and, and that pretty right. much goes to any song. So once that was set, I was able to like, now I didn't have to stay behind the drums and play the same part over and over while my guitar player was somebody was trying to figure out their part. Play it right. again. Oh, play it again. Oh, play it again. <laughs> so I yeah. loved the fact that the drum machine was going and now I could get on and sit in the circle with the with them on acoustic guitars or the piano yeah. and start to actually develop help writing the song. And getting right, getting more into the creative process besides just keeping time on exactly. the record. So, yeah. and, then, and then when it came to recording, you know, I, I used to, un, uh, uh, Butch Jones was uh, uh, engineered most of my sessions. And uh, to this day, he's, he's still he's still my main recording engineer. Mm -hmm. And but back in the day, you know, I, I one time I was I was playing around and I took the, the, the top of the shore off. I unscrewed the ball and I put it up. I hit it and I noticed it, it, it sounded like the bass drum. So mm -hmm. I kind of just I hit it again and then I took the plug and I plugged it into the back of the Lynn drum machine. And then I put it up against the bass drum inside because the head was open. Right, right. And I, and I laid on top of the pillow, put it up against the bass drum. And then when I hit the bass drum, it would trigger the sound of the Lynn. So I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And then we even cheated sometimes. Sometimes I did hit the the microphone yeah. and, and and it sounded like a bass drum so they're all it's like whatever different. whatever works it gets you there right <laughs> yeah you know you're making exactly. a record it's a totally different process than playing yeah. a lot and then um from there i i just started to get into the whole drum machine programming drum machines and then i was getting hired for studio work to either mm -hmm. program drum machines play on top of drum machines play right. just snare drum up with the drum machine play just hi-hat and cymbals you know whatever it whatever it called for and then when the simmons came out i was completely completely blown away i saw the thompson mm -hmm. twins and I, I i wish i have to look up the period i keep saying this when i do interviews because yeah. i, I want to give that drummer who was playing with them at the time that was probably uh, like 84 84 85 right somewhere in the mid 80s i guess yeah the early 80s and i like i like definitely... that and i like that music like a lot of people bag on that stuff but i'm like you know what it was cool there was a lot of creative oh. stuff going on and mm -hmm. No, to me, ABC and uh, Spandu Ballet, that right. whole... And then I had a band called True Blue around that period, and our lead singer at the time, uh, Michael, he sounded exactly and looked like the, the singer in ABC. So when we oh. met and he was into that scene, my bass player from, from Mantis, John Kaz, yeah. we started a band in Mike Riddle um, called True Blue, and that, that, that was our sound. And we almost got a deal. We got offered to go to England and at the time, it was just not the right time to make that move. I, I just had a, a son, and it, it just it just wasn't the right time. Yeah. Um, we, so should, we should talk a little bit. We should talk a little bit about uh, Mantis uh, with a U, as you pointed out to me. Because <laughs> um, Mantis actually, it was that's an interesting story. So you guys, at first, it was I think it was called Gypsy, right? That band. Yeah. Well, first we were Uncle Sam. Um, um, my buddy Dennis Rosales was in that band and uh, Robert Martiri was on bass and then me and, and, and uh, Frankie were in that band and then that was Uncle Sam and then John Kaz came into that band, our uh, bass player. Mm -hmm. And then uh, me, Kaz and uh, Frankie, who we called D because his last name was D. Crescenzo. So we started Gypsy and then we got uh, a different guitar player, uh, Jimmy Bradford into the band 
And then uh, from there, we we had a keyboard player. We went through keyboard players like <laughs> it was just we we I don't know why we just could never find the keyboard player that clicked. Yeah. Um, and then we got another guitar player, Jimmy Mayer, and uh, the band started to change a little bit in direction, but we were still playing the same type of material. And then we started writing songs. We were into writing a lot of our, our, our own material, and um, that band became Mantis. And then uh, two years after we were like that was the core band in uh 76 and then in 78 seven late 77 early 78 we got an offer for a small deal to do dance music and and play disco yeah and d- disco was king right then right and that that was like that's all you know <laughs> saturday night that, fever <laughs> that, yeah that was i mean that was filmed right near my house i mean you know it, it was a great period of time and we still looked like a a rock band, you know. Right. Really, you know. Yeah, really that, that's an, that's the interesting part about that story, I think, too, is because you guys were actually playing pop rock kind of stuff, and then I think a um, a guy that owned a small label came and saw you. You were jamming on what Brick House or one of those tunes. Yeah. It's a yeah. fun. It's a fun story, actually. Yeah, that was at Trudy House. Um, yeah, so he he saw us, and we would goof off because you know we'd be playing in this club called Trudy Hells at the time in New York at like, you know, two o'clock in the morning, yeah. two people in there, you know, it's like, but <laughs> your club owners, you never know who's watching. That's you right. Do your job. It doesn't matter if there's nobody in the club, you never know who's going to walk in. Well, but that's actually that true, night, right? <laughs> absolutely. And that night there we were goofing around because nobody was, you know, there was maybe three people in the club and they were going to leave soon. And it's two o'clock in the morning. And uh, we start going into brick house, at, you know, I think we had just played two Zeppelin songs and then we went into Brick House and all of a sudden this gentleman came in, he sat down, he heard, I think, the the, the end part of the Zeppelin song and then he heard us play Brick House for about a half hour because we figured we just jam now on Brick yeah, House. Just having fun. Funk- yeah. yeah, that was a song that we would just jam on it. So we were funking it up and then sure enough, the club owner came over to yell at us because he wanted to know what what what, what are we doing? Uh, <laughs> this is not practice time, as he would call it. And then after he left, we all kind of you know we, we were wise asses from Brooklyn. We kind of yeah. like, you know, okay, whatever. You know, he, he yelled at us. Okay, you know, bad boy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then uh, you know this gentleman came up to us and he said, uh, "Boy, I have a small label, uh, a disco label, and." Uh, you know, I really like the sound that you guys have. And do you think you could come in and, and do a couple of disco songs? Can you write any disco songs? Do you have disco songs? We had no disco songs. <laughs> like and we, disco. Said, <laughs> we said, yeah, we could sure. do that. We were like, sure, no problem. We yeah, we could build a house. <laughs> we're never going to see this guy again. And yeah, sure, he's got a label or whatever, Funny. you know. So he leaves, you know, and then he keeps contacting us and we, 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 we go, in, we go into the studio, you know, we always did pre-production back then. Yeah. The studios cost a lot of money back. Then. Right. Yeah. Um, so we did our pre-production and we wrote what we thought were disco songs and they were a little bit heavier and it's not like we listened to stuff. We heard stuff, I guess, subconsciously. Cause now yeah. when I hear that was, that, well, that was everywhere back then too. You couldn't get yeah. away from disco. <laughs> so subconsciously. Yeah. I mean, I was in clubs all the time. So subconsciously, you know, I was hearing that sound, but it's not like, you know, we said, oh, let's write a song like this. or let's, let's, you know, let's do that. Yeah. We just, we just wrote what we thought was, was disco and dance right. music. And it turned out to be a little heavier than anybody else. And we were a band. Everybody else was like a studio project. Right. They're put together. Yeah. Right. We were writing our own songs. We were playing our own songs. We were co-producing our own songs. Um, you know, Butch Jones was engineering. That's how we that's how we met Butch. So yeah. we did our first record. It went out Canada, made a little bit of noise. Um, we were getting goofed on now because we were a disco band. <laughs> oh, your, then, all your buddies are like, come on. <laughs> yeah. And then it was funny because at, at one time in Brooklyn, there was a, uh, out on Kings Highway or Quentin Road, there were two clubs. On the corner was, uh, oh my God, it's slipping my mind what it was called. It was a disco, big disco. And the other two block like half a block down 
was a, a rock and roll club called Zappas. Ah, okay. And uh, this guy, Mitch Carduna, who we still talk to today, uh, he used to run and book the rock bands there. And that's how we met him. Oh, Fantasy Island. That was the name of the, the disco club on the corner. <laughs> that's so a good we used, to go <laughs> into, we, used to go, we used to go into Fantasy Island, all of us, with, you know, whatever girls we were hanging out with at the yeah. time. Long hair. We stood out like we stood out like like you would not believe. The rock um, guys. Yeah. And then we would go play at Zappas and we would play rock. So they would be playing our records, in, uh, disco records in Fantasy Island, and we'd be <laughs> hanging out. People would be looking at us, not knowing that that was us, really. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, everybody thought we were a black group, which we were very proud of. And then we had a gig at Zappas. So we would go over to Zappas, and we would play our rock and roll, you know, and we would play our rock and roll. Hey, that's cool, and though, right? You get both sides. <laughs> we, 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 we didn't think it was cool back then, but right. now, yes. <laughs> now it was, it, it's considered very cool. And you guys, with, with so, Mantis, you actually had some top 10 Billboard hits, right? I mean, like some big, couple of really big tunes. Well, yeah, on the disco scene uh, between 78 and 80, um, before disco got, did the whole disco sucks movie, it came in and got a bad rap. <laughs> We won't we talk about three, that. <laughs> yeah, three top ten da dance records on the charts, and we That's toured awesome. Europe. We did TV in Europe. I mean, yeah. we became. Uh, I became very good friends with Tony Thompson at the time because he awesome. was a rock drummer, and right. he was in. The, I mean, Chic was way bigger than than we were, yeah. and um, you know, and we used to you know talk sometimes and say, "Man, everybody thinks we're disco drummers," you know. <laughs> then of course Tony. You know, I, I started doing studio. No, work you're, you're actually working drummers. <laughs> well, that was yeah, but at the time it was you didn't yeah, think I know. that way. I guess there was so much work. Nowadays, you know, even with getting songs into TV and and, and commercials, and that's all everybody wants now, right? If yeah. somebody offered you that back then, it would have been like an insult. You would have said, "No way!" Like they wanted us Mantis when we reunited. They wanted us to go to Vegas. They told us we can get you guys gigs in Vegas. We were like, "No, we're not going." Yeah. To Vegas. <laughs> You know, and now, well, I feel that we, way living we here. So. Go, you know, we, 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 don't, we don't want to do it anymore, but right. we would, go, you know, now you want to go to Vegas and play. Yeah. So the time, you know, the times, it's, it's all timing. So yeah. we had those three records. And then I, when I started doing studio work, because I was known and working with a lot of people in the dance industry, I was still doing all my sessions playing on 12 inches and remixes and right. playing in a DJ booth with uh, Bashiri Johnson and, and Fred Zaw. Awesome. Scotty Blackwell playing, you know, all the big clubs at the time live on the air yeah. to millions of people, you know, and uh, playing live in the DJ booth. You know, he Scotty had three turntables. I had my uh, uh, some of my pads sometimes, if not buttons, you yeah. know, same thing with Bashiri. Fred had his keyboards. So we did that for a while and no one could figure out what those mixes were because <laughs> Yeah, it was live because that was that was cutting edge stuff. I mean, back then, right? That's this is before remixing. This is before all that, or just the very oh, beginnings. Ab yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And at the time, you know, you're just doing it only because it's fun, you know. And you're out right. in the clubs. I was out in the clubs anyway, so now it's like it was easier to just, you know. And and of course, I was complaining, like you know. <laughs> Oh my God! I got I, I would leave my house. Oh, that's the midnight. old give a give a musician a gig, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I would leave my house. At, I would leave my house at midnight. And then, you know, get to the club, you know, uh, you know, to, to, to play from like one to about three. Right. That's when it was at its peak and it was aired live over the radio, you know, and I, I did that for about a year and a half. But of course I complained. I was like, oh, I got to go to the city <laughs> now. It's like, it's like, but I'm so glad that, that I did do it, you know. Yeah, was, yeah. I mean, that's, amazing. I mean, that's the thing is you're, and you're working, right? You're a working musician. That's like, the, that's the dream. I mean, it may, sometimes it's not exactly how we envisioned it, but that's okay as long as you're. You're you paint you're, you're you know supporting your family and well the, and that's how it happened with the magazine you know it, it it just became a thing that organically happened and um you know I had no I hadn't I never worked in an office in my life so I had no clue as to you know what it was going to be when when Ron Spagnari the founder of Modern Drama I you right. know, I was very I was very good friends I mean Modern Drama used to do a couple of little tiny stories on me once in a while, or they would mention what record I was on, you know, so when, I was when, into my team. Well, I'm sorry, what, what year was Modern Drummer actually founded? It, it, for me, it just feels like it's always been around, but what, what uh, year did they 70, start? 77. Wow, 19, okay. Uh, yeah, 1977. So, um, yeah, I was 20. And, wow. you know, I, I grew up, you know, reading Modern Drummer religiously, uh, and then I was on it when I was in Modern Drummer, Right. Um, and then I, 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 I had uh, 
met Ron Spagnotti. Um, I went to the first Modern Drama Festival. Um, Dave Weckl had played that. I remember that because my wife was pregnant. Oh, wow. And um, what year we was got that? Invi- with, with we what? got invited to the, uh, to the festival. Excuse me? What year was that? That was uh, the first Modern Drama Festival. So, uh, no, yeah. So that was, uh, Maddie was born in 88. So it was 87. So 10 wow, years. okay. Years after the magazine started, awesome. Um, so um, uh, Dave played that time, and then I was a guest. Ron had invited me to the festival because I was like, you know, I was on the road and I was, you know, yeah. somewhat famous, but not really. Um, so I was invited to the festival, and I went, and then uh, I, I I hit it off with him really well, and we had a really great time backstage. And he used to throw these elaborate thank you parties, you know, after the festival. So uh, he invited me to the, to the after party and, awesome. and we became, we became f- friends and he kind of became like a, a, a father figure as we got to know each other because I lost my dad so young. Yeah. And um, he, uh, he asked me if I would help at the festivals, they were going to do it. They were going to start to do it every year. Now, of course, that was the first one. No one knew what was going to happen with the festival. So right. I said, yeah, of course. Yeah, you know, no problem. Because I knew a lot of the manufacturers. I knew a lot of the artists. Um, so I became the artist liaison. And that became my thing uh, for a couple of years. Hmm. And then um, through that, uh, I got closer and closer to Ron. And uh, he asked me, uh, you know, he, he had told me that he, he was diagnosed with cancer and I was devastated because that's where mm. I lost my father to. And then yeah. my first thing to him was, well, what's going to happen to the magazine? You know, I was concerned about my God, he built this legacy and he, yeah, cause history. he was a real, he was a real force with that magazine. Right. Uh, no, he was, he was, it, it's all circumstance of, of why and how it happened. You know, he was, he could have been the drummer in the four seasons, but he had phobias. So he didn't want to, you know, that wasn't his thing. So mm. when he came up with this crazy idea, um, you know, to, to, to do this drum magazine, uh, you know, everybody thought he was out of his mind, but he went ahead and, and just did it. You know, he, he saw his vision and, and he did it and circumstance, you know, just, it, it just happened. It, yeah. it really just became iconic, became the Bible. You know, I, I still think to this day, you know, people say it's, uh, you know, some, some people might say, well, you know, it's been around so long. It's, you know, it's, it's not, it's not hip and cool. Well, you know, what's hip and cool. I mean, when, when well, really I mean, business- you know, the thing about Modern Drummer, and because I, I, you know, I, we were talking about that before we, we started, and, and I, I mean, I have a drumming background, but I, you know, obviously bass player, but I've always read Modern Drummer. I've a always very good actually, bass player, excellent bass player. <laughs> well, that's very kind. Um, but I, the thing about Modern Drummer is that it's not only a great drum magazine, it's a great magazine. It's actually one of the world's, I would say, top musician related magazines. And that has a lot to do with you and Ron, of course. Um, and I, I mean, the work that you guys do is great. And also spotlighting new, new players, the, the festivals, all of that. It's just amazing what you've created. I think. Well, thank you. I know. And I can't take, I can't take the, the, you know, the, the full responsibility for that um, because that modern drama has always been a team effort, you know, whoever's right. w- working at modern drama, you know, throughout the years, I mean, mostly everybody has been there for, for so many years until recently, because we got a new publisher, things had changed. That may have to be a part two, you know, because, uh, you know, we could stay on for, for, for days. Right. But um, gotcha. we, we do have a new publisher. He's got very good ideas. Um, the 18th of February, I don't know when this is going to air, but the 18th of February will be one year that he became publisher. Okay. And when he signed, after working out a deal for a whole year, he signed those papers February 18th. And then two weeks later, the pandemic happened. Right. Yeah. So Which changed right everything, now. Of yeah, it, modern drummer is like you know it, the, the the ball was rolling and now it's like it's 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 you know it's all over the place yeah. because he you know he needs to reinvent it. He's he's a new person coming in. He's letting some people go. He's hiring new people. He's got a big big job on his hands, but he he has some great ideas. He seems to be doing the best that he can to get it going through this pandemic. Um, he could have gave up. You know, the pandemic right. would have been a great excuse to give up. Um, because it's not easy and, and being in print has nothing to do with uh, any magazine, the quality of the magazine or what the yeah. magazine, you know, it's just the way of the world. This way CDs uh, eventually, you know, took over from vinyl. Now 
you know, Digital somebody, versus the other day wanted, print, right. somebody the other day wanted me to send them a, a song demo of a song we wrote that they might be interested in. They wanted it on a CD. I, mean, I, I, we were <laughs> I don't even have a to way to play a, a CD. CD. <laughs> yeah. And then somebody said to me, CD, I don't even have a CD player. So, exactly. <laughs> so someday, <laughs> you know, we, yeah. there may not be magazines someday, yeah. but so what? There's going to be other outlets. Monodrome is always going to be around. It's never going to yeah. go away. You know, so um, what's you what's know, your we, um, your your technical uh, title at, at Modern Drummer? Because I know you're kind of a man of many hats there. But what's your, what's uh, your official? My, well, my is fool on the hill or no women. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, so you know it's like, <laughs> but uh, my 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 official title is editor at large. Uh, okay, which, which is uh, covers a lot of bases. I was an editor, then I was an associate editor. Right. Uh, then I became uh, one time I, when I started, I was, uh, an advertising assistant, you know, and, uh, you know, it was different steps that I went through, but, uh, in, in, in the last, uh, 10 years or so I've been, uh, editor at large, which is, uh, you know, I had to look it up to see exactly, you know, what, <laughs> exactly. what, 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 what is exactly is that? <laughs> like, is that good or bad? Does that I mean, mean more I money know, or? <laughs> I know I'm getting older, I'm putting on a little bit of weight. Is, is that, is that the problem? But yeah, what are they I trying mean, to tell me? Wait, yeah, it's like, and it's like, but then when I read it, I was like, oh, yeah, this is the perfect job for me because editor at large, if you look it up, it just means that you basically have no boss. Right. That's <laughs> a good you, job. You just, contribute, <laughs> you just contribute what you want to contribute to the magazine. And if they go for it, they go for it. If they yeah. don't, they don't. So, but, you know, um, I, you know, I, I, I make light of it, but, you know, it is, yeah. a, it's a team thing, you know, it's, it's no one, it's no one, one person. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, the thing is like, I, I write for jazz in Europe magazine. Um, my editor, Nigel actually co-produces this show and uh, like, that is a big job. People don't realize what all has to go into the coordination, the scheduling uh, to put out a magazine. Like what, what's that? I mean, you've been there doing that. What's, what's that like on a monthly basis? Well, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of work and it's, 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 you know, people, nobody thinks about you know behind the scenes you know what goes right. on behind the scenes they just see the finished product same thing when you're making an album you know um thankfully because people like you who are interested and care you know people get to explain certain of how things are done and everything but you know the magazine it, it takes a lot you know it people call me sometimes uh, you know uh, for subscription problems i I have, I don't, I have no like, idea I about, know. you know, I, that's, I, that's yeah. not my department. I have no, you know, I turned them on to the, you got to call customer service or whoever, you know, yeah. whatever you got to do, but there's a lot that goes on, you know, with printing and then True. schedules and then photos and then photo shoots. And now we can't do photo shoots because, um, you know, only a few, uh, right. because of the pandemic, you know, nobody's on tour. So, that's a big part of speaking to somebody about a tour and, and, you know, being on tour. So that you can't talk about that. Exactly. Um, yeah. No one's releasing records uh, in the, in the amount of time, fast time that people are. So th it's, it's, it's getting harder and harder to, to express yourself and let people know. So of course now these kind of formats, you know, yeah. cause now you're also dealing with the digital side. So you've got actually two different, jobs going ex off at the same time yeah exactly exactly and it's hard to you know for for, for all, right now it's it's it, you know we're, we're going through reinvention so there's people leaving people coming in so you know that, that when things get back to normal i i mean i think by time things get back to whatever normal is going to be yeah we'll be ready you know everything everything should be ready What's um, some of your your highlights working with Modern Drummer? I know you've actually become friends with some some people that you admire. One of them was was Ringo. Um, how has that been for you? I must that must be almost like a childhood <laughs> dream to meet your your inspiration. Well, right? yeah, and, and and the funny thing is, uh, my job in Modern Drummer had actually nothing to to do because I met Ringo before I worked at Modern. Oh, Drummer. okay, cool. So um, I got to know him more. Um, of course, through Modern Drummer, because um, I, David Fishoff at the time, who runs the Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp. Right. Which is um, great. Those are great. Absolutely. Uh, and I've been involved in that for, for almost as long as I, I've been involved with, with Modern Drummer. Um, so um, he started the All-Stars and put together Ringo and the All-Stars. That was his concept and his idea that he approached Ringo with. And it's really it made Ringo's, you know, it made Ringo become 
yeah, to, he, he deserved him in a way. Yeah, yeah, he deserved to be Ringo, um, but that definitely helped. And uh, when I would, I went to a, I had already met Ringo a few times before. The first time I met him was he hosted Saturday Night Live. Oh, okay. Um, a girl that I was uh, living with at the time in in New York worked for MTV. Uh, Maria, thank you, Maria. And um, <laughs> you know, we were living together, and she got me uh, backstage uh, as a surprise uh, to go to the Ringo Saturday awesome. Night Live and watch yeah. in the little you know room, and and then I got to say hello to him after the show. But as I was shaking, this is funny, you know, I don't say this too often, but uh, as I was shaking his hand and saying hello, and just you know thanking him you know right. and, and he was hysterical on the show the show was unbelievable yeah some he's, he's, a, he's a fun fun guy like oh he's he's, he's, he's he has a great he's sense so, of humor and, yeah. he's so cool so as i'm shaking his hand and I, and I nod to bob and i say it's nice to meet you i turn my head and jamie lee curtis was standing <laughs> and i'm shaking his hand but i'm looking at like, jamie yeah because back in jamie, the day and i'm like wow yes, jamie lee. And this is like you know jamie lee curtis at that time was you know on the cover of rolling stone right and her, exercise and you know and she's yeah, in movies yeah. and she looked very very good i didn't realize at the time she was starting to date christopher guest who she's still married to 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 this day uh, so okay. that's why she was backstage but i was shaking ringo's hand and it was great to meet him to touch his hand and you know I me mean? but i was also i don't know who was exciting me more ringo or, or, or you funny. know or jamie lee but um so that's, that's when I first met him. And of course, you know, he wouldn't remember that. He wouldn't know that, you know. Yeah, so yeah, the yeah. second time that I did meet him, I had told him that story. And I guess it kind of, he thought it was funny. And, uh, you know, but he didn't know my name for years. He used to call me Drummer Boy, or he used to call me uh, Mr. Rock and Roll, or he, you know. <laughs> well, um, he, yeah, he, he meets so many people, but it's great oh that he, my he, God, he no, I know, it, yeah. It, 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 yeah, so it, it took it took years and years. And then as I as I, I was working with uh, with David Fishoff, um, you know, we would do more and more stuff. And then, of yeah. course, you know, I, I just got to know Ringo more and more. And then Elizabeth Freud, who, um, you know, we don't want everybody, I, I hate to say a name sometimes, because then everybody, you know, bombards her with, with calls but um you know she was very instrumental in in me becoming friends with, with Ringo I mean mm -hmm. I, I love Elizabeth and I, I thank her for that so much yeah um her and Dave you know they were both very instrumental in in, in me me and Ringo but that did you know it just me and him kind of just it became more than just now me from the the magazine, right? You know, because you, you've it, actually it, you sat in with the band and you've you've you a number of times, right, with his All Star Band and yeah, yeah. I, I was fortunate enough uh, to sit in two times with the band um, and the All Stars, which you know I tease, yeah, with, with I, I, tease them, I, tease, I love I tease I tease Ringo. I you know I tease him about that too. After the first time I did it, he was like, "Pretty cool to play with me, right?" And I was like, <laughs> "Yes, absolutely." It's like a, I was like, "I can't believe it even happened." I said, "But." How fun! Todd Lundgren and you know, and yeah. then I'm naming everybody else that's on the stage, and he's crazy. Like, ah. Yeah, I know it's crazy. Yeah, I, I used to play with Billy Preston. I know he did that for quite a while too. And, and yeah, uh, Billy was yeah, Billy yeah. was on 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 that. I mean, Billy even with George back in the day. I know. Um, yeah. Oh my god! I love, Billy. I love and, Billy. and that was the first Billy Preston. My son's first concert at five years old was Radio City, Ringo Starr and the All Stars, and the drum tech, Artie uh, Smith was one of the drum techs. And of course, Jeff Chonis, um, he got me one stick of Zach because Zach was playing in the, in the band at the time. And one stick of Ringo, which happened uh -huh. to be a prototype of his Promox stick. The, the, it's, it's uh, I got to look, I have the blue one and then it came out red. Now, now he's yeah. not with uh, Promox anymore, but he got one in one stick and um, Ringo was already gone. So, uh, we met Billy Preston that night. Yeah. And Billy came over and we didn't, you know, we didn't take pictures, you know, this is 19, like in the early nineties. Yeah. So and it's, it it's awkward. Like, You're like, Hey, let's take a, let's take well, a photo. <laughs> yeah. Well, we would have, you know, if it was yeah. like these days where everybody just, right. Right. He's got a phone. Yeah. phone yeah. Exactly. You know, yeah. you know, that's a different story, but he was, he was hugging Maddie and, and you know, he was mm -hmm. talking to Maddie and Maddie told him that, you know, he was there to see Ringo and, you know, he loved the Beatles. And yeah. at one time he thought the Beatles were his uncles. 
because <laughs> uh, in, in my in my hallway, you know, as I have these the white album in frames, you know, sure, to, yeah, the floor them in my hallway when you go out and then go downstairs. So when we used to, when he used to be in my arms, I used to go Uncle John, Uncle George, Uncle Paul, <laughs> Uncle Ringo, and then we go funny. down, and then we come That's when we come home, we come up, Uncle Ringo, Uncle George, you know, and we go, yeah. and then after a while, I I I'd go, who's this? When we walk by, and he go, Uncle John. And then I go, who's this? Oh, Uncle Ringo. Oh, who's this? Uncle? So, and I, and, you know, I told, I had told Ringo this story, uh, you know, not that long ago. But at one point, um, so he just thought that, that those guys were his uncles. Yeah, he's like, so, hey, this family. <laughs> yeah. And then at one time, he, he's, he's, he's playing with his friends out in the street, and they come running in, and they, they run by, and they knew that I played music. You know, yeah. his, his friend Bill knew, and, and Maddie was just starting to really have an entrance. I mean, he at five years old, there's a video of him playing a Beatles song. You know, it's nowadays everybody, you know, plays, but back then it was a little bit rare. Um, and he's playing, you know, I saw her standing there. I, I used to let him just play and, you know, that's how we started. Right. But his friend came in one day and, and they're running in the hall, the doors open and they run by. And as the, ki- the kid's running by, he goes, Hey, is that your father's band? And, and Maddie goes, no, those are my uncles. And he just runs into his room. And I, and then the light went off in my head. I'm like, oh, my God, I got to let him realize that. Oh, no, I should well, probably that explain is- it. <laughs> so the day that Let's I go got visit to- Uncle Paul. <laughs> yeah. So the day that I got to, to, to introduce him and his wife to, to Ringo after I met Ringo so many times. But yeah, the yeah. day that I was able to introduce Maddie now, who was an, an adult, um, to Ringo and see them talking to each other and, and, and you know, and as a dad, yeah, you know, how a cool. Right. It, it was just, Oh my God. It was, you know, there's nothing like a beetle. I mean, yeah. you know, I met yeah. so many people in my life and, you know, I don't really get starstruck. I met John Lennon, uh, Paul, you know, I just waved to, we waved back. Um, George, I almost got to meet. I was actually at sound check and, uh, uh, something that happened and uh, it, it didn't work out. Um, and then, of course, Ringo. So, I yeah. mean, I've met so many people. There's only a few people left that, that I really would like to meet, um, you know, while they're still here. But right. I, I very rarely got starstruck. You know, I never I never got starstruck. I never asked for an autograph ever in my life. I've only been, I have, I think, maybe three or four, and they were all given to me. So I, I never, you know, I was never starstruck. I you know people used to say people say well man like that night after playing with Ringo my life you know I'm, I'm the same person and then all of a sudden the next day everybody's looking at me like a completely different way besides the hundreds of texts and phone calls I get right. saying congrats this was this is a dream come true oh my god this is great can you introduce me to Ringo can you get me tickets for Ringo's <laughs> show can you give this to Ringo right. I'm like Oh yeah. my God. And then all of a sudden people are starting to pay attention a little bit more. They want to interview me. You know, they, they want to talk, I guess they Google me. They, they find out, you know, cause even at modern drama, there's a, a, a fine line to walk where I don't right. want, I don't, I never pushed my career. Like I don't, some of the younger generation, I would never even tell them, you know, they yeah. knew I played drums, but I wouldn't tell them that I played on hit records and I, you know, and I, I you know, I did the whole thing yeah. unless they ask or they knew. Well, you that's know, the otherwise... you know that's the interview thing too because like for me, I, it's not about me; it's about the person I'm interviewing. And like you said, like that almost becomes a distraction if they know your background <laughs> in a way. Well, yeah, and, and you know, and it becomes a phone call nowadays, though, because we're doing it like this, and a lot of people are right. doing it this way. It, it comes in handy because it, it's nice when people do their homework and thank you for doing your homework. Um, because a lot of people don't, you know. Yeah. And, a lot of people, you know, before this pandemic, I know, I know we're like all over the board, but That's okay. I mean, before this pandemic, it was get off social media, get off your phone, get out, play with other musicians, go right. to concerts, into, learn the, that younger generation is not getting people skills. They're not learning how to communicate. See, I'm talking with my hands like an Italian, but they're <laughs> not, they're not communicating they don't know how to how to talk to people they don't know how to play with other musicians they know how to play these a million notes to slipknot or all these bands yeah and they get a million views and that's all well and good but there's no money uh they they get pigeonholed into a certain thing they're not learning how to function in a band which is important right and it's right it's it's good like i said 
everything is a tool and how you use that tool is what's important. So, you know, now it's all of a sudden the pandemic happens and now we're forced into don't go out, don't go to any shows, can't go right. to any shows, can't play around, can't play with other people, just stay home, send tracks to each other. Everybody yeah. stay on social media, just talk. So then all of a sudden, everybody's a blogger, yeah. Yeah. everybody's a, a podcaster, a podcast show. <laughs> everybody like everybody's coming like every and then they realize, oh, this is this is this is hard. This is this yeah. is not that easy, you know. Or well, people call me nonstop asking me for contact information. Hey, I'd like to interview so and so. I know you're friends with them. Uh, can you pass their information on? Uh, no. Yeah. Yeah. Do your <laughs> own work. You know, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I can't because we just cover them in modern drama. And if you have more, you know, yeah. pull and publicity. And you're going to get them in front of more eyes than modern drama. Absolutely. I will turn them on to you. Right. But, you know, I can't help you become, you know. Yeah. You got to do the work you, yourself. You yeah. want to start talking to, you know, famous people. So yeah. it's all down to how you use the tools. That so, actually brings us to a, an interesting thing, because what, what, what would be your advice? Um, well, young musicians, but then also people that want to get into being a music journalist, which is a very specific kind of thing. Like what, what's your thoughts on that? And what's your, your advice to, to young people? Okay. Well, now here's something that's going to cause a lot of controversy. That's, that's why I asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not, but I'm kidding. I, uh, I don't consider myself a journalist or a critic. Um, I, I even get annoyed when people call me now, someone in a suit, you know, right. back in the day, that meant, you know, you worked, on the other side, in the record company, you know, uh, I am 100% a music lover and a musician. And I write for a magazine that happens to be, that's the outlet for it. Um, but I am not a journalist and I get in trouble all the time, even with some of my fellow journalists, because, um, you know, they are journalists. They went to journalism school, you know, right. they, you know, but I didn't go to journalism school. Um, uh, I'll say it for the first time ever in my life in an interview, I didn't even graduate high school. Yeah. Because I was on the road. Yeah. You know, I get uh, it. They, I was, I, I, I was my, the same thing. Same thing. My, yeah. my last year of high school, you know, I, I, you know, I, I was on the road. I mean, that's, that's what I was going to do. And my school was being on the road. My school was becoming a musician. My school was recording, learning, hanging out with people that I admired and loved and watched them make records and learn from them and take lessons. I took lessons with Bernard Purdy. Um, you know, I took lessons without even knowing I was taking lessons with so many people because I would be hanging out with them at Soundcheck. And then they mm -hmm. would play, I would play. They would tell me, you know, hit the drums while I go listen. You know. So um, I'm not... I'm not what you would call a critic or, you know, and critics, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to have bash the critics, but. Yeah. Cause they have, everybody has a place, a role to play. Right. And it's your opinion. Yeah. You know, I don't, uh, critics sometimes could, could really destroy a, a movie or a band it's food. You know, it, it's just, it's your opinion. And certain guys that can come off as good critics uh, and not use their own personal taste or make it that it's it's their way or or no way it's you know that's that's their word oh this this record sucks no this record you know yeah it's your like suck. you said it's your opinion you right. just don't like it you right. know for whatever reason um so i was never into the whole critic thing um and then as far as you know a journalist uh yeah i mean i english was my favorite subject in school thank thankfully and, um, you know, I, I write lyrics, you know, and I write songs, so I'm able to, to you know, somewhat write, but, you know, I still need a copy editor. And, and right. Even the greatest writers in the world need copy editors and you need exactly. another set of eyes. Just yeah. like when you're mixing, you need another set of ears. Um, yeah. I like to write as if I'm speaking, you know, uh, I don't know if that's a, a Brooklyn thing or, or, you know, it's just that. But and I've been complimented by people who wrote books and, and you know, yeah. on, on my writing which surprises me, but, you know, I, 
but I wouldn't call I wouldn't call myself a journalist. But you know so, what that is. But uh, what that is, Billy, is that that's a big reason why I think Modern Drummer has been so successful is because it's from real players, guys that are actually out there doing it, not somebody who's went to journalism school necessarily. That's telling you their their thought about it. You lived it. You've been there, so you know what guys care about and what they want to what they want to know about. Right. Right. And well, thank you. And that and that's you know that's that's what helped. You know, that's that's why I got the job. That's how I, you know, I stayed where I was. You know, I, I never my intention at Modern Drum, I didn't know if I was going to like it. I never worked in an, in an office and it was right. far. You know, it was it was it was, a, it was a, an hour commute if there was no traffic because they were in Jersey and I'm in Brooklyn. Um, and I did that for 15 years. And then it went from three days just to try it out to four days. And then five years after Ron took me under his wing and, and taught me, you know, the business of the magazine running the magazine he, yeah. he passed away and mm-hmm. then i had 15 years without him um and you know i had no idea i knew i wasn't going to go back on the road but i still wanted to play music but i i kind of liked I, I it just worked out that i kind of liked what i was doing yeah and you got uh, a family right you, you it know. kept it, it kept me in the business um i was still able to do music um so it it it, it just it just it worked out you know it just worked out but uh i wasn't you know i wasn't schooled as a journalist and i didn't start that job till i was 40 years old so you know yeah at 40 years old but you had a lot of a lot of good life experience and you knew you know you know what you know what what drummers want to know you know what what musicians want to know about that's important doing and, a magazine and and, yeah. and, and then you know and, and and getting older and 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 knowing so many people from the time i was on the road and was a kid i became friends with a lot of people before i even got to the magazine and sure. that was one of the things that ron used to really like he used to bring me in to to um to the editors meetings and he would want me to sit in and just listen and then you know i always had somebody I was friends with somebody that Modern Drum was trying to get in touch with. So right. I was able to get in touch with a lot of people without going through a publicist, without going through a manager, yeah. just to say, hey, uh, Modern Drum wants to do a story on you. And a lot of, a lot of times, they, these bands were already superstars. They didn't need us. You know? Exactly, yeah. So we just wanted to give them publicity because let's face it, Everyone likes publicity, especially drummers, because they're always yeah. stuck in the background. Because they never get, but, they usually don't get, unless you're Neil Peart. Yeah. You know, so, like, so of course, yeah. you know, drummers, yeah. you tell them, all right, uh, I just need an hour on the phone. Then you're on the phone for three hours, and it's like, yeah, oh, yeah. my God. <laughs> but, um, you know, so it, it all just organically happened. But back to your question. I'm sorry to drift. But That's okay. Back, back to your question. Um, the advice that I would have is you don't have to be a journalist. It's, it's unfortunately you know, it's according to what you're writing, of course, you know, but if you're writing about something that you know, and you're passionate about, you, you, you just do it, you just write it, you know, yeah. you still, everybody needs a copy editor. So if anybody out there wants to write a story for somebody, all they have to do is write it and send it in, it's going to go through, it's going to, I mean, if it's, you know, constantly spelled wrong, and you know, yeah, caps where there's not supposed to be caps on you know know your thing know what that songs are in quotes and album covers are yeah, have, have you know, your details it, your dates your right, names right. Yeah. and then people you know that that's just format and um but there's no reason why you can't express yourself and you can't you know nowadays it's all video so people do a lot of talking right. so they're not writing as much and that's going to become a problem down the line too because people are there's going to be a different way of writing. So that yeah. whole journalism thing that you're learning properly, how to speak or properly, it's how all to changing, right? Yeah. It, that that's going, you know, that's, it's not like that anymore. Same yeah. That, that, that was my too. thing for, for jazz in Europe, because I actually, I mean, you know, my writing thing, like you, like my writing thing, um, I, you know, we all studied it in school, but my technical writing aspect has not been my strength, but I love doing interviews and I love the video thing is, is just a new avenue. And honestly, the reach, right? I mean, we have our music pages. We have like 7 million followers on the music pages. And that's just hard to get that kind of a reach with with traditional print, um, exactly. which is which has led you guys to also really have the digital outlet as well, which is going really strong for you guys too, I think. And the timing. Right. You see, in a magazine, in print, there's a production schedule and there's timing, mm-hmm. you know, and you have to be a couple of months ahead to get that scheduled so that when it goes hits the printer it's printed 
it goes to subscribers, it goes on the newsstands, you know, all that's changing. It's not going in that flow anymore. Right. Bookstores are closing down. Um, music stores are closing down. You know, everything is online, you know, ordering. I mean, Amazon is like, you know, they, like everybody says, they make, you know, not to make light of it, but they should have them deliver the vaccines and it'll get done because yeah. I mean, you know, you, you could order something. I could pick up the phone and order something right now. It'll be here tomorrow. It's, I am. It's yeah, it's, it's, it's right. It's a whole different world for sure. Yeah. It's a complete, it's, it's, it's completely different, but you know, as long as the information's out there, sometimes though, like with music, there's just the opportunity to do it now. So easy. It's, it, it's hard to like weed through and find like the, the real gems and the right. real gold. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, that's making it a little bit more difficult. And that's where I'm saying like the kids nowadays, the, the younger generation and uh, no, I'm not an old man. I don't want to hear you say you sound like an old man, but you know, they want to just press a button. And if it doesn't happen, their attention span is like, Oh, now nah, next. Yeah. Yeah. It's they got not, the, the 30, you know, 30, 40 seconds and they're on. Yeah. And, and yeah. until somebody's able to put a chip in your head and control you, which we don't ever want to see happen. Right that's not the way of the, that's not the way of the world you got to have empathy you got to have compassion and you only get that from being interactive with people yeah. you know you have to you, you i wasn't taught I, I, in a way i was because my mom was very outgoing my dad was a little bit more quiet he said very little but when he said something it was very powerful yeah. My mom was like, you know, they used to call her the mayor of the neighborhood. And, you know, my, my mom knew everybody. My mom talked to everyone. So I guess when she was with me in the store, walking with me, you know, and I, I just saw her being friendly to everybody and, you know, talking to everyone yeah. and anyone, you know, so that just became you learn my, that, my, right. my yeah. personality. I mean, yeah. I never intended ever to be the face of modern drama. Like sometimes they'll say, oh, well, you're, you're the face of the magazine, you know, and Sometimes I get resentment for that. Sometimes I get praised for that. Sometimes I get blamed for that. You know, uh, that, that, that was never my intention. You know, right. it's, it's not my magazine. People yell at me sometimes, you know, like it's my magazine because they're not on the cover. They haven't been on the cover in X amount of years or whatever. I, it's not just up to me. It's not, you know, yeah, my, it's a I team, right? Say, yeah. It's not my magazine. You know, it's not my magazine. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 it's you know it's it, it is what it is but I, I think i think that that's that's great, great to point that out that actually it's a team like it's not just you making the decisions right it's it's a it's no, it takes a huge I mean, team right? we all suggest things and we all you know and 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 now with uh david frangioni who's our, our new our new publisher you know he's been a drummer his whole life he he grew up reading modern drama religiously awesome um awesome. he uh you know he he has some good ideas i i can't I know David a long time. Um, uh, I'm the one who who actually got brought him in to, to speak with with uh, the Spagnardis and 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 actually finalize the deal and make the deal. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I can't. We don't know exactly what's going on yet because um, it's uh, sorry. It's okay. We don't know exactly what what what's what's going on yet because of the pandemic. So right. I tease them. I tease them all the time. I'm like, well, first I wanted to make sure that he was going to, you know, he bought this thing and he had all these plans and then the poor guy, you know, got knocked right, right down because sure. of the pandemic. So I tease him all the time. I don't know exactly a hundred percent if he knows what he's doing yet. I tell him all the time <laughs> because we, he hasn't had a chance to do anything. Yeah. Yet. It but, takes time to but, learn too. But the little that he's that he has been doing, I already see improvements. You know, some things we you know we still disagree on, which is that's yeah. like being in a band. You know, I, yeah. I always say the editors were always like being in a band. When you're in an edit meeting, it's it's like being in a band. Everybody wants their song. You know, yeah, like I'm Ringo. Band. Who's gonna be Paul? <laughs> yeah, it's like yeah. Here's, no, I want my story to go first. No, right. my song. No, you know yeah. my story. My song. That's you know? good though. You so, need that, right? You need the competition. Yeah, a that's, bit well, that's how that's how it works. That's how yeah. it becomes a team team effort. But, um, you know, he's got a lot of challenges and, and, and you know, and he, so far it seems to be there's some things we still you know disagree on, you know, which is going to be normal. Right. And uh, no one's right or wrong until it's done and it works or it don't work. Yeah. So yeah. there's been some things, though, that he's been doing and implementing that have been, uh, you know, 
pretty successful in, in moving forward. Yeah. And it's like you said, things have changed in the digital world. So it's sort of, it's good to have new blood and, and people that are, are motivated to, to change because not, not everybody is. So that's, that's, a good it's thing. hard and change is hard. You know, yeah. no, no one likes change. Everyone gets into a routine, but you do have to re even as an artist, you know, you have to reinvent yourself every couple of years. Right. That's you know, true. Because otherwise, you know, it's just, it, it just becomes the same. And then people are like, yeah, I've seen that. I've heard that, you know, yeah. so you have to, you have to reinvent yourself. Thank you so much for joining us, Billy. I, I you know, I, I know this is, we were talking about this beforehand that you're not, it's not your comfort zone necessarily being on this side of things because you're used to be on the yeah, other side. It, 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 it's odd. I always, you know, even when people come up and actually to sign something like a drum head or something, <laughs> yeah. I, I always think they're goofing on me and I always think they're fooling around and then <laughs> they, they really sincerely want me to autograph something. And, you know, and I, I say the same thing all the time, you know, it's only going to bring the value down. So I don't know how I, you know, having me on your show, I really appreciate it. And, uh, well, Thank I think there's, there's a lot of a lot of interest, and in, and Modern Drummer is a great magazine. You've created a great legacy along with 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 um, with Ron, your mentor, and and I think it's it's awesome to see. I'm excited to see what you guys do moving forward, and I know there's a lot of changes coming, but um, I'm excited to see the digital end of it, and and the print is still as great as it's always been. Um, but thank yeah, you so well, much. Yeah, well, one thing I will say is you, you should everyone out there. Uh, you should subscribe because yes. subscriptions, um, you know, you're going to get the most for your money and you're going to get a digital edition, a, a magazine, if you still like the magazine, or you can get either or you can get both. And then there's a lot of things that, you know, extras that you can get by subscribing. Right. So stop writing on Facebook and asking <laughs> questions and like, you know, complaining that, you know, we all know the mail system has been a little screwy. Um, so some people are not getting the magazine like right away. Um, and then some people get it sooner than they ever got it. So, right. you know, there's, there's a lot of things going on when the world comes back to normal, you know, if you are a believer and supporter of modern drama, the best way you can support and get all your information and get everything you need is to go to the modern drama page and subscribe. Yeah. And what's, what's the, what's the trust, actual web? What's the website? Uh, Billy? Well, it's just moderndrama.com. Right, but, easy. I mean, yeah, you know, and then, yeah, right at the top, I think um, there's a subscribe button that you hit and it gives you all the packages and everything. And it's fair. You know, um, we just did the festival for Neil, you know, which was right. we raised a lot of money for Neil's charity, which was a great thing. And, and that yeah. came off really well. Um, so, you know, there's things for drummers that, you know, we're still here. You know, we still want to give you all the knowledge and everything that we could possibly give you about drums and drumming and beyond, you know, there's, there's more than just drums and drumming these days. There's yeah. songwriting, you know, there's, there's playing. It's not all about just playing for the chops. All that stuff is great and it's good exercise and it's good to know. But then, like I said, that's, if you want to take anything, you want to squash this whole interview and just say that one line tools, it's how you use all these tools that we are given. Right. You know, we're given so many tool, tools with social media, with YouTube, with the advantages of getting to everybody to make your own CD, to be able to film stuff. I mean, I, 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 I see some of these kids' videos there. Oh my God, if I could make a production like that, I can't even make a production like that now. I know, you know yeah, I don't it's have crazy. Yeah. They have, you know, they, they make these, you know, what's available to them. And, and, it's, and it's not expensive to, to buy all this equipment and, you know, set up the studio and, and you know, do your thing. We just have to all figure out a way that we can all get reimbursed and paid for the, if, if it costs nothing to make music, then absolutely music should be free. Right. Absolutely. 100%. If it's not costing that artist or, or anyone a penny to make a record or to put out a song or, or to, to be involved, then yes, music should be for free, but that's not the case. Yeah. And you it also have years of, years of practice and, and all, sort of all that stuff, right? Yeah, the talent. I mean, you got to have the talent, of course, yeah. but to put it all out and, and, and do it, it's like, you know, that's that's when the work starts. Right. So, you know, you got to, it's all it's all the tools, you know, same thing with when MIDI came out and, and you know, and any anything, you know, Pro Tools and, 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 and any kind of, uh, you know, recording equipment and, 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 and whatever you need is it, everything is a tool 
So just please, the younger generation, just pay attention to how you use that tool. It's a tool. Like you use a hammer to, to, to put the nail in, you know, you might use the hammer to take the nail out. Right. It, use any tool that's given to you. Think about how and why you're using that. Yeah. Tool. It's communication and, and the music's the most important thing, right? The song. And yeah. Ultimately, I mean, um, well, well we thank will, you so much. You know, you're welcome. And we're going to include all your information, um, contact information for Modern Drummer and all that um, on the podcast description. And uh, thank you so much, Billy. I really appreciate your time. And, thank you. Uh, yeah, this will be out uh, coming out in the next uh, week or so, two weeks. Well, yeah, just just let just let me know. I will definitely let you know. And hopefully, yeah, we'll get together and and, and trade some tracks. In person and play. Yes, absolutely. I, I, I love. Yeah. I told you, I, I uh, one of the reasons why I did agree to do this is I, I watched a couple of videos of you playing bass. So oh, I, wow. I, you're an excellent bass player. You're my kind of bass player. <laughs> Thank and you. then when you told me that you've started on drums, I can see we spoke about that, you know, the Larry Graham with the, 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 yeah. the thumping of the, you know, popping of the bass, the funk for me is always, that's, that's for any drummer. That's, yeah. You, know, I, that's, you gotta love, you gotta give love to, to Larry. <laughs> yeah, he was nah, an original, it, all those guys. It's great, man. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, Daryl. And uh, please, everyone, stay safe. Awesome. Thank you so much, Billy. I appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye.